On Saturday, the White House announced that they would be relaxing sanctions on Venezuela's oil industry, allowing US company Chevron to restart extraction in the country. The announcement came the same day that acting president Nicolas Maduro agreed to restart negotiations with US-backed opposition led by former leader of the National Assembly, Juan Guaido. So in this video, we're going to look at why Biden's relaxed sanctions. Hint, it's about oil, why Maduro has agreed to restart negotiations with Guaido, and whether this could provide some respite for the Venezuelan economy and ordinary Venezuelans. Let's start with Biden. As we see it, there are basically two reasons Biden has relaxed sanctions. First, it's because the maximum pressure campaign that began under Trump has clearly failed. The US first imposed sanctions in 2006 in reaction to Venezuela's refusal to cooperate on anti-drug and counter-terrorism efforts, but they were significantly scaled up under Trump after the 2018 election, which was widely decried by most of the international community as a sham. In the aftermath of the election, the US and some other Western countries refused to recognise the result, and instead recognised Juan Guaido as Venezuela's true president. As leader of the National Assembly, Guaido was the constitutional successor to Maduro in the event of a presidential vacancy. Trump's maximalist sanction regime was essentially part of a wider effort to unseat Maduro and replace him with Guaido, which even included issuing charges of drug trafficking and corruption against Maduro personally, and putting a $15 million bounty on him. Four years on from the election though, and it's become clear that Trump's maximum pressure campaign has failed. Today, Maduro looks unlikely to be toppled, and Guaido is just not a plausible president, not least because he's deeply unpopular with ordinary Venezuelans. If anything, Trump's massive sanctions have lent credence to Maduro's claims of a foreign conspiracy against him. Biden has probably decided that he's better off restarting dialogue and focusing on organising a legitimate election in 2024. So that's the first reason. Trump's maximalist campaign has failed. On to the second reason, oil. As you've probably noticed, energy prices have been going crazy recently. From 2014 until the pandemic, oil prices averaged about $50 per barrel. This year, as economies around the world have reopened and supply has failed to meet this increased demand, oil prices have spiked, reaching a high of about $122 in May of this year. While they've since come down a bit to about $85 today, that's still pretty high, and American voters aren't happy about it. Usually, the American solution to this would be to ask the Saudis to increase production, but the deteriorating US-Saudi relationship means that the US can no longer rely on OPEC, the international cartel of oil producers, to keep prices low. OPEC is led by the Saudis, who are the largest oil exporter and the only so-called swing producer, which means they're the only country that can rapidly scale production up or down. Despite recent diplomatic efforts by the White House, Saudi Arabia has refused to significantly increase production and OPEC even cut production in the weeks leading up to the midterms in what looked like blatant electioneering by the Saudis. Biden will probably hope that this relaxation of oil-related sanctions will increase Venezuela's oil output, which is currently at a historic low of about 500,000 barrels per day, thereby bringing down oil prices and improving his electability. So that's why Biden is relaxing sanctions. But what about Maduro? Why is he agreeing to restart negotiations with Guaido, given that he ditched them just over a year ago? Well, it's probably because Maduro is feeling increasingly isolated. In the aftermath of the 2018 election, Maduro made his bed with Russia and China, who both recognised him as the legitimate president. In the years since, Russia has helped Maduro run his hydrocarbons industry, while China has brought copious amounts of Venezuelan oil. However, Chinese support has waned, and China has gone from unequivocal support for Maduro to advocating negotiations between Maduro and the opposition. While Russia is still a staunch ally of Maduro's, Maduro will be wary of relying too heavily on a country that is fast becoming a political and economic pariah. You get the idea, Maduro needs new friends, and this may be the beginning of Venezuela's diplomatic rehabilitation. 
This might explain his recent meeting with Emmanuel Macron in early November, which was conspicuously cordial given that Macron has previously described Maduro as illegitimate. So that's why this has happened. On to the final part of this video. Will this help the ordinary Venezuelans? For those of you who don't know, Venezuela is currently suffering through a crippling economic crisis, which has made it one of the poorest countries in South America, when it should really be one of the wealthiest. With the world's largest known oil reserves and an estimated $14.3 trillion worth of natural resources, if Venezuela had enjoyed a competent government, it could have been the Norway of South America. As recently as the 2000s, this didn't look impossible. Accelerated oil extraction turned Venezuela from one of the poorest countries in the region in the early 20th century to one of the wealthiest, and by the late 1970s, when Venezuelan oil reserves were at their peak, Venezuela was one of the wealthiest countries in South America, as measured by GDP per capita. As recently as the early 2010s, when oil prices reached historic highs, Venezuela once again became the wealthiest country in the region, with an inflation-adjusted GDP per capita of over $16,000, on par with Central European countries like Poland, Lithuania and Latvia. However, in the years since, Venezuela's economy has collapsed into a hyperinflatory mess. While Venezuela's official statistics authority stopped publishing data in 2014, the IMF estimates inflation hit 65,000% in 2018, and Venezuela's GDP per capita has fallen by about 80% to just $3,000. Now, while sanctions played a part, most of this is thanks to economic mismanagement by and rampant corruption amongst the Venezuelan government. During the oil boom of the late 2000s and early 2010s, Venezuela actually ran pretty big budget deficits of between 8 and 15% of GDP. What this means is that, despite massive oil revenues, then-president Hugo Chavez was spending more money than the government was raking in. This isn't a good idea if your country is a petro-state overly dependent on oil revenues, because when oil prices fall, as they inevitably do, you're left with less revenue and more debt. This means that when oil prices crashed in 2014, just a year after the election of Chavez's hand-picked successor, Nicolas Maduro, Venezuela was plunged into economic crisis. Maduro's confused economic policies, which included printing tons of money and price controls on everything from oil to toilet paper, led to hyperinflation and a collapse in living standards, and his regime has been beset by near-constant protests. So will these sanctions do anything to ease this economic misery? Well, no, at least not in the medium term. Chevron is unlikely to start extraction for a couple of years, and even then the oil revenues are unlikely to go to the Venezuelan people. Nonetheless, if Venezuela continues to normalise relations with the US and the rest of the international community, the chances of economic stabilisation will improve. Anyway, if you're interested in more economic stuff like this, then check out our new channel, TLDR Business. There, we unpack all kinds of business stories, like the ongoing drama with Twitter and Musk threatening Apple, why everyone hates Ticketmaster, and why everyone's getting fired in big tech at the moment. If that sounds good, then click the link to TLDR Business in the description and subscribe for more.